guys. I'm desperate. Man. Welcome to View DC. Welcome to Politico. Yeah. Really happy to have you here. Um, uh, definitely check out our Git, our Discord. Uh, we have our own server, and um, it's a great place to go and hang out and talk, view stuff. Um, uh, the very famous Ben Hong is on there, and other people to help you with your problems. <laughs> so uh, next month's UDC uh, is going to be <laughs> lightning talks, and it's not on It's on January, right? Oh, I just, yes. Yeah, sorry. Slides wrong. That's okay. January 18th. Yeah, January 18th. It's, we always do the middle Wednesdays. Uh, we try to do uh, try to do meetups once a month, middle Wednesdays. Um, uh, so we're doing lightning talks. We're just going to be at Bloomberg. And uh, if you've never spoken before, um, this is a great time to present. Um, uh, we're, as you can see, we're a really friendly atmosphere, and we're always looking for people to talk. But this one in particular, we want to get as many people as possible talking. Um, if you've done anything at all in view, whether it's business or not business, um, please, please, please submit your talk to us. Um, and if you've never done it before and you're really nervous about it, like we can even help you uh, walk through it. Um, and um, you know, it's your chance to really um, try it out and see see how you like it. So, highly recommend. Please, please, please submit talks. Uh, so, uh, conference is coming up. I believe these dates are correct. Uh, View Amsterdam, February 20th to the 21st. Uh, View Conf US, which is now the third year, uh, is March 2nd to 4th. We have two people here who are going to be speaking at View Conf US. Ben Hong, who speaks all the time. And now Jack Kappa, brand new, first time he's going to be speaking at a gigantic conference. Congratulations. Yeah. He'll be doing his TypeScript talk. So super stoked about that. I believe Bloomberg is even sponsoring uh, a space. At, are we? Yeah. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. Oh, it's, well, it's in New York team. They only tell us so much. I saw its name on it. Does this? Yeah. So seriously, Lightning Talks. Um, lots, of, lots of people who have never done it before have done it here. And... Uh, we'll record it. You can even watch it later on. It's fully worth it. So please submit uh, vjsdc at gmail.com. Um, I believe also on VDCIO we have a link to the web form. No? No, but I put it in the Discord channel, but I'll do it right now. Okay. Again. Yeah. Like we have a form. We have a form that you can fill out, and we're watching that. Uh, and so we'll get back to you like right away. But again, anything view. If you've done anything at all with view, even if it's JavaScript and you think view can be incorporated with it, you can help with that. And more importantly, you need help putting talks together. Yeah. It doesn't have to be 30 minutes long. Like we're looking for, uh, you know, preferably 10 to 15 minutes. But uh, even if you have a half-hour one, we can help you bring it down. So many thanks to our gold sponsor, Politico. Um, we are hiring. Um, we're looking for one full-time front ender. Um, we're a heavy view shop, so it'd be nice if you knew view. Um, not required. We'll we'll look at your work anyway. Um, but we are hiring. Uh, if you go to politico.com slash careers, uh, just look for front end, you'll be able to find it. Um, there's also a uh, group of interactives people who do React work. Um, and uh, they have a big election coming up next year, and they have an open position as well. Andrew, thank you so much for coming. Andrew's going to talk about scripting to the sandbox. All right. Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 Um, I don't hang out much in the view community, so uh, if you haven't seen me around, uh, I'm a human. Um, I, uh, I write lots of code, particularly JavaScript, but uh, uh, general is all across the stack. Um, I have worked in a number of different companies across a number of different in industries, uh, including uh, starting in sales, radiology technology, um, then a stint in small business, business to business applications, uh, Rails application, and now I'm working at 18F, uh, which is a part of the General Service Administration trying to help improve the experience of government software, um, federal government so software specifically. Uh, in that vein, I have uh, a collection of 18F stickers over here, including one, uh, just one login.gov sticker. So that's a hot commodity. Um, but today I am talking about. Uh, JavaScript and kicking scripts to the sandbox. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk today in uh, three different uh, major sections here. Uh, trust and security, then we're going to talk a little about, about mal malvertising, uh, and then talking about the browser sandbox itself, sandbox itself and how you can extend it to add additional rules to protect your users. 
So, um, what if I told you to go on your phone and download this application? Would you do it? Show of hands. If you were telling that one? That one. This one specifically. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay, how about this one? Me. No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> how about this one? <laughs> yeah, right? How about this one? <laughs> okay. What if I told you to go to this website? Would you go to this website? Okay. How about this one? Yeah. Okay. How about this one? <laughs> A real TLD, by the way. Uh, great. Oh, it's exactly what you expect. <laughs> Uh, how about this one? <laughs> also a real domain. <laughs> That's a real domain. Yeah, yeah. So, like how, how does that work? <laughs> Magic. Uh, no, no, I mean like... Yeah, there's, there's no reason why you can't include any kind of character in a URL. They're all characters. Um, so, the point I'm trying to make here is that there's, there's a, a different set of rules that you apply when you're talking about downloading applications to a device versus navigating to websites. Uh, people inherently trust navigating to websites more than they trust downloading applications. And there are good reasons for that. Uh, and they are these. Uh, that there are a set of security policies that apply to websites. And those security policies restrict what developers can do uh, on your device. And that's a good thing. Um, so like, you know, these scripts that you're running. If you're thinking about this, you're really downloading code and executing it, downloading untrusted code from a domain you've never been to and executing on your computer. It's kind of a scary thing, but because of the browser sandbox, you don't have to worry as much about it. Um, so these scripts cannot access these sensitive parts of your device. Uh, the content can't be like giant. It can be a significant amount of data, but it can't be something that's gonna overtake your hard drive and prevent your operating system from booting, for example. The browser reserves the right to delete it at any time, which is handy. Uh, and that pages and scripts across different sites can't communicate with other ones. So if you try, you know, if you're going to poop.la, it can't get your uh, your banking information, for example. So sandboxed, right? This is the, this is the whole concept of a sandbox. Um, and the one thing that I want to talk about today is how this security has changed over time. So the web has already, always had this kind of sandbox approach to running code, um, but the web, secu web security and the things that um, the security community is looking at has changed over time. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about these modern things in this, in this talk today. Uh, and if I leave you with one thing, is that I want you to know that you're responsible for the safety of your users. So I'm putting that in your head today, right now. And we'll say it again at the end. Web security, it, your, the security of your users is your responsibility as a developer. So, for example, remember this? This thing happened a while back. There were these like apps that accidentally sent a bunch of data to Facebook. Accidentally, maybe accidentally, maybe not, who knows. But Facebook should not be getting access to your period cycles. Of course. But that, this is an example of a developer who didn't think through this security and didn't think about how the, the data that they're providing and exposing to other people uh, uh, inside of their application. So let's talk a little bit about cross-site scripting attacks. Um, malicious third-party scripts running in a trusted page, right? Uh, let's talk a little bit about advertising and social media embeds. They're just non-malicious, right? That's, that's really the only difference here. You're giving the same amount of privilege uh, to advertising code, to social media embeds, that you're giving uh, a cross-site script attacker. So that gets us into our second part right here. Um, malvertising and the principle of least privilege. So malvertising, malicious uh, software uh, advertising, uh, when there's a trusted third-party script and it kind of betrays the trust that has been put, put upon that script um, by the developer. Um, so you may have seen something like this before. Um, there are rounds of these that happen on the web where you're like looking at uh, a page and then suddenly these like pop-ups appear or like this one that appears. Uh, 
And if and if you're paying attention, if you're someone who like really can follow uh, what happens on the internet, you'll notice that this website has actually re-navigated the user to facebook.com slash walmart.com, uh, which is what's hosting this script that's running, right? Um, so what's happened is uh, a, a script has come in, uh, re -nav has navigated the top level navigation of this user away from the page that they intended to be looking at and have now loaded this other bit of code. And these are like, you know, serious, serious news, news, uh, news websites, news organizations, right? Like, um, I don't know, this one, this one doesn't say, but this one's a New York Times article. It's like, these are not, these are not small organizations. Um, they are large organizations, right? That, that theoretically should know better. So, uh, yeah. We often don't see the power that we're granting to third, to, to third party scripts. Um, how many people have seen the annoying site before? I hear some groans, all right, all right. Um, I'm not gonna try my luck today, so I'm just gonna play the video. Um, so this is a video of me navigating to the annoying site. Uh, and I want you to pay attention to the, the frame rate uh, of, of what happens here. Uh, and you can really see how much this exact laptop is struggling on this website. So let's go to the annoying site.com and you can click or hold down the space bar or whatever. And suddenly this happens. Same. So it's trying to move these these windows around, and my computer is just at this point the fans on my computer are just like. <laughs> um, you might notice it's downloaded a whole oh bunch of files, because um, that's an API that you give people access to. Um, surprise! Uh, it's also played uh, a picture picture video. Uh, I don't know if you knew that you could do that, but you can do that in Safari. Um, it's uh, every time you try to close a page on a key press, uh, it will request your camera or microphone to bring up that dialogue. Um, it's also um, it's also back here in this in this in this page. It's actually submitting GET requests to all the logout endpoints um, for common websites. So it logs you out of of, uh, of Google and Facebook and all those other things. Um, so this is this is the kind of power that you're giving every script that you load into your page. Don't forget, um, the, don't forget the search history. Oh, I don't, I don't remember what it does with the search history. What oh, does it, it do? It, it pulls up like Google and Bing and all kinds of stuff and starts searching like, why, does my, why is my poop green? Like, <laughs> so you go with your search history, you've got a couple dozen <laughs> really interesting things to search. So don't do it at work? <laughs> <laughs> don't do it at work. <laughs> also, maybe not on a computer you like. <laughs> It's uh, yeah, especially if you're using a browser that restores Windows when you quit it, um, because then when you open the browser again, they all come back up, um, which is not ideal. Um, yeah. So what if you have a pop-up blocker? Um, so it just uh, if you have a pop-up blocker, in this case, it does nothing, um, and that is because if you remember, the first action of this page was to click or hold down the space bar. Um, and pop-up blockers uh, do not block pop-ups that are in response to a user action. Um, and that is a user action as in like you clicked on something or, and this, this, is, um, this is kind of a, a standard concept in web security that if it's a user invoked action, then you shouldn't be blocking it, which generally works correctly. Like if you, if you were trying to click on like, um, you know, open a new window button in, in Gmail or something, you want that to open a new window. You ask it to do that. And so as, as long as it's been the, within the context of a user action, it's considered that you're, you have consented to open the pop-up. Does incognito mode prevent this? No. Nope. <coughs> I guess your search history doesn't get stuck. <laughs> I have um, a question. Yeah. If you don't give that website access to your computer, you know, like, you have to actually give access to a website or application to your computer, to your phone, in order for it to download files. So if you just say cancel, or you tell it no, they can't do anything. Um, your phone will block it, right? It depends on the browser. Um, the download API, this was November 5th, I think. Yeah, November 5th. 
As of November 5th, Safari did not block it. I don't know. Uh, I haven't been keeping up on the can I use for the download API. But this is a specific JavaScript API for downloading files. Okay. Um, so as, as far mm -hmm. as I know, so this, this and the annoying site was actually created to demonstrate how the security model of the web is broken uh, and has resulted in a number of browsers changing their security policies. So that may be one that has changed, but I do not know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, so, what I'm advocating for here is the principle of least privilege, basically. Um, for example, if you have trustworthy neighbors, do they have access to your house keys? Like, maybe. Like, my neighbor has my house key. It's very handy when I get like an Amazon package and I'm not home. Um, but do they have everyone's house keys? Like, no, like you wouldn't have the keys of, like one person would not have the keys of everyone on the street. That seems like a problem. Um, so, if you have a trustworthy application, uh, do they have access to data um, from other applications or the ability to delete all of your photos? It's like, oh, like, that probably shouldn't be. Um, so, so what I'm advocating for here on the web is that we need to do a little more work to follow the principle of least privilege. Um, so unless you, unless you limit third-party scripts, they have all of this power. Um, and they have this power to do horrible things. And like, you're responsible for what, whatever that ends up being. Uh, as the developer of website. Um, so, how do we fix it? Uh, extending the browser sandbox. Um, so, the thing that's uh, awesome and terrible about the internet is that uh, it's backwards compatible by default. <laughs> so that means that all these like new shifts in like better web security um, don't actually result in more secure pages unless you opt into them. Um, and there, every time that this like backwards by default model is changed, um, the this causes like a big a big hubbub. Um, so you may have heard slash are hearing a lot of hubbub around Chrome and other browsers now deprecating uh, certain versions of TLS. So saying that HTTPS sites are no longer considered secure unless they have a modern enough version of TLS. Um, and that's like a good thing um, because the older versions of these security protocols are no longer secure. They can be easily hacked. So how could you, as a web browser, say that this website is secure knowing that the page is not actually private? Um, so at some point, right, you have to change that rule. You have to change the this is a secure site into this is a not secure site. Um, and every time one of the browser manufacturers goes about changing one of these security rules or goes about, um, you know, removing a particular API or changing something, it causes this sort of big hubbub, um, which I think is generally a good thing. Um, but with security, uh, I would say you probably want to be on the leading edge of these technologies uh, if you can. So implementing them as early as possible so your users are as secure as possible. Um, and this type of security is available today and is opt-in, and you can opt into it. And we'll talk about that. So uh, the first one is old. This one has existed forever um, and is the lowest of low-hanging fruits, I would say. And that is that, by default, cookies can be read by JavaScript. Um, so uh, your JavaScript scripts can uh, run and access session cookies that are uh, sent by your server, for example. Unless you have this little flag, HTTP only. Um, this really should be named something else because it's HTTP and HTTPS. Um, but eh, it was made a long time ago. Um, and this, if you just add this flag when you set cookies uh, in this header, um, JavaScript no longer sees the cookie. It doesn't exist, uh, which is fantastic. Um, but the cookie still gets sent to the server, which is important for being functional. Yep. How effective is HP Web Inspect in terms of looking for these vulnerabilities? I don't know anything about HP Web Inspect, so I cannot answer your question. Does anyone else? It's a, it's a tool that, that we, we use in the government, at least in my agency. What agency? BLS. BLS. Bureau of Land. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Labor Statistics, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't used it before. Okay. Um, a slightly newer version, uh, a slightly newer security, uh, security feature of browsers, um, which is also quite useful, is um, setting a custom referrer policy. 
So by default, when you navigate from one site to another site, um, the previous URL is sent to the next URL. Um, so this is really helpful for like tracking analytics, like which sites sent users to your site. Um, but the downside of this is that that means that if you are <coughs> looking at potentially sensitive information, um, the URL, which may disclose the contents of that page, are then sent along to the next uh, site you're going to. So if you are saying, say, looking up um, domestic abuse shelters, and then navigate to the next page, that, ne that next domain now knows that this user has been looking at domestic abuse shelters. Not a good thing, right? In this particular case, that data is considered sensitive. Um, so you can set uh, no referrer, for example, um, which will uh, tell the browser, hey, don't do that. Just, just don't send that information. Um, and as a result, that next page that gets, that, gets a blank referrer instead of the referrer of the previous page. Uh, which is nice. Um, there are also uh, there's a couple of other different uh, settings here um, that we can talk about. Refer, no refer when downgrade. Um, so that's saying if you're going from HTTPS to HTTP, don't include that information. Um, uh, and then a bunch of other um, different specifics uh, to, to tweak that behavior just how you want. Um, and the, as I showed on this last slide, you can either set the refer um, when, as an attribute when you're embedding an iframe, or you can include it as a response header when you're serving a page. Um, there are also certain behaviors that you can prevent. Um, and the, the interesting thing about this particular, uh, this particular um, sandbox uh, attribute uh, or content security policy uh, section, I don't know what you call it, sections, um, is that once you turn it on, it is now, uh, it is now an, an inclusion list um, rather than an exclusion list. So once you enable the sandbox, uh, now everything that you once, you, once you add this attribute, everything is disabled. And now you have to turn the things back on that you want. Um, so this is super handy when, you know, I was mentioning before about malvertising. This is super handy when you're talking about uh, advertising embeds because uh, you probably want them to allow certain things like probably running JavaScript. Um, but you probably don't want them to do certain things like navigating the top URL away from the page you're looking at. Um, and again, you can set those as an attribute or as a response header. There are a whole bunch of these um, because, as I mentioned, once you, once you set it, it disables everything. So these are all the things that it would disable. Um, presentation mode, uh, pop-ups, um, pop-ups to escape sandbox. Um, so by default, a pop-up that loads from a sandbox origin then has the same sandbox restrictions, but you can enable that if you want. Um, scripts, top navigation, that's the one I mentioned. So this, if that um, advertising script on the New York Times that I showed before, um, if that had specified this and not specified a lot of top navigation, that, that um, particular pop-up would never have happened. Um, so uh, a couple, yeah, to highlight the uh, pop-ups, uh, allow same origin, oh, that one's actually, I'm glad I, Remember to put this in the slide. Uh, allow the same origin. This one's really important because once you set the sandbox, um, the that domain is considered cross-origin by default. The origin is actually null, um, and so as a result, you can't access cookies or set things in local storage. Um, any 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 sort of things like that. Access caching, um, and so if you set allow same origin, then it, it just turns all those things back on. Um, and allow scripts, yeah, for when you want JavaScript to execute, say you have a view app. Um, and then uh, the last one I want to cover, I think the last one I want to cover here, uh, and then I have a quick demo to show, and then we'll yeah, kind of open it up for discussion. Um, but um, the content security policy uh, has all of these like wonderful nuggets in it. Um, and uh, we already talked about the sandbox section of that um, directive. Uh, there, there's the thing, the original um, content security policy header was just used for these um, allow lists for domains. Um, so this, this says that like, you know, by default, the browser loads um, all things from everywhere, whatever is embedded in the page, but you can restrict that and say only load images from these domains, only load JavaScript files from my CDN, um, which is super handy as a second line of defense for cross-site scripting. So if you have some, some, somehow someone injects some code into your site 
that then would want to load a script from some other domain, <coughs> the browser will look at this header and say, like, hey, hold on a second. Like, that domain isn't in the list of scripts that I'm allowed to load from. And it blocks the, or the request. Um, so the allow lists um, are, you can break them up very specifically. <coughs> the default source, it just covers them all. Um, and then you can then specify specifically, like connect for WebSocket connections, um, fonts, frames for iframes, images, manifests for application <laughs> manifests, um, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. This one's really small. This one is, uh, it is, <laughs> great question. I actually think you can set it in an attribute as well on an iframe. Does anyone know? Okay, I know, I know you can set it in a meta tag, um, a meta HTTP equiv tag in the header, um, though it is slightly less effective there because theoretically JavaScript could be modifying the, the header tag. Um, so you, your, your footprint of tag is a little bit bigger, but definitely server-side tag is the way to go. You may be able to put it on an iframe as well. Good question, though. It would, it would seem like I was saying that by not including it in the slide. Um, I don't know. They're old slides. So sorry about that. Um, and then the one thing I wanted to, to highlight here right at the end is this report URI. Um, so the content, or the content security policy can be run in a report-only mode, which is super handy for when you um, don't know what you're doing and you don't want to break your website, um, which is like everybody in the beginning. Um, this is really scary to tell a browser to not load things from certain domains. And I guarantee that you will forget how many domains you're loading things from the first time you write one of these policies. Um, I enacted one when I was working at Harvest. I enacted one and like forgot like nine domains or something. I forgot our I forgot that we were using Braintree payments and like broke their script thing and well, would have broke their script thing, uh, preventing us from making any money. Uh, but thankfully, we deployed it in report only mode for the first time. Um, and that then when you set this report URI, it's an endpoint on your server that accepts JSON blobs. Um, and the browser will actually post to you a JSON blob every time it would have blocked a response, or a request, rather. Um, so then you can take those reports and look at them and say, like, oh, crap, I forgot to include, you know, Braintree's payment host in, in my list of allowed scripts, and now I can't process things. So it's like, oh, okay, now I can go in and, like, add that to my allow list. Uh, and then those reports stop coming in because the browsers are no longer blocking them. The report only mode pretends like the policy exists but doesn't actually enforce it and sends you the reports. Um, if you take off the report only mode, it will still send you the reports, but it will enforce the policy as well. Um, uh, this shows how little rehearsing I did. I have one more, I guess. Um, this particular browser, browser features you can turn off. Um, so anything the browser can do is allowed by default, uh, which is like not great. Um, so uh, instead, this is the same thing as the same approach as the sandbox. So uh, mm -hmm. once you specify this, um, it uh, oh that, no, that's a lie. Uh, once you you specify this, and you can say none here to disable things. So for example, um, ads that you don't expect to have uh, video components. Um, or ads that you expect to have video components, but you don't want to have to have them play by default. Um, you can turn off autoplay. Um, you can also prevent them from doing geolocation, um, accessing the geolocation of the device um, via the geolocation API, that is. Um, yeah, a bunch of these. So again, this is a, 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 good, a good reminder of all the things you're giving access to. Uh, when you load, when you allow scripts running. Uh, all these things, yeah. Oh, 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 no. Button got stuck. Button got stuck. Okay. Feature verse, we got that one. Okay. Applying these techniques. So uh, I'll pull up the demo really quick here. But um, yeah, so I, I started thinking about this around Twitter because I wanted to embed uh, tweets into a site that I have a pretty tight content security policy around. And I started looking at all the things I had to enable to get um, to get Twitter to be to run the Twitter embed to run, and I was like, oh, I don't want this. Like, I don't want to give all this. I don't want a lot to allow Twitter all this data and allow so much access into this site. Um, do I want to give Twitter the, the, all this control of my users? Um, and so I started on a path, and I never finished it. So there's no conclusion to this story. <laughs> 
Um, I do want to show this uh, demo here. Um, yeah, so this is just a page that I've loaded, um, uh, just a little HTML page. But this is just an iframe twice. Uh, I've ordered them one in red and one in blue. This one has no restrictions, a normal iframe embed, no, no special code or anything. Uh, and then this one down here, the second one, uh, specifies the policy sandbox allows scripts, allows same origin, allow pop-ups, and then also restricts uh, refer. Um, oh, I forgot to run this on a local host. This would, because this is a file domain, because I'm just loading the file, it has no refer by default. Sorry, that demo. I should have loaded on HTML or HTTP. Um, but yeah, so uh, there's this link here, and if you click it, uh, it will navigate you somewhere else. Um, if I have, well, I, I don't know if I have access. I don't have internet access. Sorry. Oh gosh, should have practiced my demos. Um, send me an alert. So you know like, these scripts can take over and send alerts, and uh, they could do that like that like thing that was popular in Zangas, where like you just can't escape. Um, but if you notice, like down here, I didn't say allow pop-ups. So if you click send me alert, like nothing happens, even though it's the exact same script. Uh, and that's because the alert function in JavaScript just returns right away, um, because it can't actually issue an alert. Um, so, yeah. So <coughs> there is this crazy idea. Um, which I was super jazzed about um, and would be interested in um, I would be interested in exploring it further with someone if you're interested. Um, but uh, you know I was mentioning that I didn't want to give Twitter access over all of this uh, all of, over all of this um, data around my users and um, this is like I'm not the only one on the internet that has these ideas of course and uh, they're the, the AMP team um, behind the, the AMP pages, the Google thing, um, which they're trying not to say it's a Google thing. Sorry, the AMP open source project that Google, ha Google heavily contributes to um, <laughs> is, uh, is, it has been working on this thing. Um, and, the, and the idea behind it is like if, if you're familiar with um, you know, DOM diffing, um, virtual DOM versus the, the legit DOM, um, there is a process where these two DOMs get synchronized, and what if you separated that across processes? So what if you took JavaScript and ran it in a web worker and had a virtual DOM attached to it, and then it serialized all the changes it made across the web worker protocol, um, uh, across the uh, message um, back to the main thread, and then the main thread executed those DOM modifications for you. Um, this is, there's a lot of super interesting reasons why you'd want to do this. Um, it's also really hard and there's a project that starts on it, uh, and it is, uh, it's, it, last I checked, it was a little while ago, last I checked on it, um, and it was still kind of like partially implemented, um, but was super interesting and would love to see it go further. Um, and the, the interesting thing about this is that you as a site developer are then operating, you're receiving the messages that are the DOM modifications. So you can then choose to perform DOM modifications or not choose to perform DOM modifications. So that's, uh, that's the interesting part of this in my mind. Does this really uh, work like a Chrome or? Uh, it would work in any browser that would support web workers, which. which I don't think I even know. Yeah, I am support. not up to date on my like seven year old web browsers, but. <laughs> well, <yeah>. uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I actually I think web workers were implemented in Internet Explorer in like 10, 9? The first one that was like good, 9? 10. 9, okay. 10? Okay, he's got the can I use. All right, I use 10. Um, so, my, my call to action. Um, please, please, please think about this when you're writing these scripts. <coughs> when, you're, when, you're, when you're using CDNs, when you're injecting third-party scripts, uh, into your pages. Think about the control you're relinqu relinquishing to these other developers and whether or not you trust those developers. Um, and that's not to say that these developers are not talented humans, um, but their interests are differently aligned than yours. Uh, and what might be a really good idea for you 
might be a really terrible idea for them and back and forth. Uh, and you're the person who's responsible for the, the, the safety of your users when you're browsing the web, uh, and you don't want your site to become the annoying site uh, when you are, um, when your users try to use it. So, so yeah. Is there a tool that you can expose your programming to that will tell you um, um, there are a number of security-focused tools. I believe there's one built into Chrome now. Does anyone know? There's like a, okay, I think there's one. Uh, that is a great question, and I should know the answer to that. Um, the question was, are there any automated scanning tools that would go through and check for um, these kind of features? Um, what do you say? Something you can do next month, right? Yeah. Yeah, right up that, oh, something you could do next month. Yeah, this would be, um, yes, yes. And it would be super cool to have an automated tool that would run in CI or something like that. Do you have a recommended template or permissions? Use um, my, I can tell you my approach. My approach is disable everything as soon as possible in the development process um, because it's really easy when you're developing something to notice when things don't work um, and then go in and turn on whatever features you need. Um, and the Git history on the lines of code which contain your content security policy, for example, uh, are super interesting um, to go back through that, that history and see like what got added at when and what times and in what pull requests and whether or not they're still needed and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I would say um, knowing that most of us don't work in greenfield projects, um, I would say the, the, my recommendation would be to um, go through like in, in one area at a time. So what defines an area? So if you're like looking at advertising embeds or something, um, try to do like one embed at a time and just say like restrict it as much as possible and make sure everything still functions the way you expect. Um, the, the report only mode for content security policies definitely are your friend. Um, I would never deploy an update. Even when I think, even when I think I know what I'm doing, I never deploy an update without going through report only <coughs> mode first. Um, and that's because I never know what I'm doing and I just don't know it yet. Um, and so, um, yeah, getting those reports right away. Uh, the moment you deploy it, and then you get like 2,000 reports, and you're like, forgot that one. Yep. So, yeah, those would be my recommendations. Okay. Yeah? For a noise site, I really like that, but I don't want to go there. Is there some kind of uh, open source <laughs> equivalent that breaks it down for you to turn things on and off and try them? Or is the noise site open source? It is open source. Okay. Um, so you can Google it and make sure you go to the GitHub one that comes up in your Google results. Yeah. Oh, and I should mention, if you accidentally find yourself on the annoying site, do not close it with your keyboard. Because hitting Command W to close, or like uh, Alt F4 to close it, the pressing of the Alt or the Command key is a user-initiated event, which will kick off the website and start doing all that stuff. <laughs> to yeah. answer this question, can yeah. you just use a virtual machine to do it? Can you kind of be safe having on it? It's like yeah, you can use a virtual machine to navigate yeah. to the site, um, which would give you another isolation layer to just like yeah. close the virtual machine. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, so I got, let me show you this. So this is as close as I got. So this actually is an embedded tweet. Um, it's not as restricted as I wanted, which is where I kind of stopped. Um, but this is actually an so if, you, if you've ever done tweet embeds before, they reject being put in iframes in general. So that was the first battle, was to like get it into an, an iframe. Um, and then 
Um, once, once, so this is this is an iframe itself. Um, and once you have it in an iframe, then you have to handle like when the tweet loads, you don't know how tall it is, and you have to resize the iframe to max the con match the contents of the thing. Um, so there's some cross-domain messaging that has to happen to get that type to work. Um, and then I started turning things off uh, as much as possible. Um, and it does actually block a bunch of things, if I remember right. Um, yeah, it like, tried to submit some form when the site's loaded. I'm guessing it's analytics data or something. Um, Syndication.twitter.com. Yeah, it's probably analytics information. Um, but you can block that. I, uh, the one, the one that really I was looking for that I wasn't able to get working was um, disallowing same origin access, um, which would prevent the embed script from accessing its own cookies, uh, which would disable tracking. So that was the one I was really shooting for. Um, unsurprisingly, their developers don't want you to do that. <laughs> so that was an uphill battle that I never finished finished it. So. So. What, so to answer your question, uh, you can, it's, uh, and this actually, I wrote this like maybe a year ago and it's still working, so it's relatively stable. Um, you, can, you can definitely restrict these things. Um, it just takes a little extra work. Um, I still, I can actually pull up. Uh, 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 yeah, here we go. <laughs> What did you say? Uh, I think so. I don't remember. There we go. So this is the best content security policy I could get for Twitter. Um, so this is the um, the like wrapper page that loads the, the tweet uh, and I pass in the tweet idea I would like to embed uh, and then I have to allow scripts same origin of pop-ups pop-ups I don't have to embed or I don't have to allow but then if you click on the tweet click on any links nothing happens which is not great for an embed um, so allow that uh, dis disallow the refer um, and then disallow autoplay access to the camera that cannot go full screen cannot allocate the user your location cannot use the microphone and cannot request web payments. Um, so that was the best one I could get in this case. Any other questions? Yeah. In general, you're, how, how are you putting in uh, are, are you taking your scripts and web packages or you are you this is 1990s uh, HTML, right here. <coughs> this is what I prefer for demos, because everybody has different tool set, tool changes, but everybody theoretically understands um, basic 1990s internet. So this, in this particular one, um, it is just, uh, I will show you, let me turn on display mirroring, hold on. Better. Okay, in this particular one, tweet. Uh, I'm just loading um, the Twitter script from platform.twitter.com. Um, so this is the the default embed script, uh, and then this all this mess all this JavaScript here is just like some. Um, some just custom JavaScript that uses a mutation observer. So I'm watching the DOM. So anytime the Twitter script, um, I mentioned I had to keep like keep track of whenever the height changed because you don't know how tall the tweet embed is going to be. Um, so whenever the height changes in the document, uh, the DOM updates. Uh, and so I'm watching the DOM for those updates and then measuring the height of that DOM and then messaging it back to the other page, which then resizes the iframe to be that height. Um, and the reason why the iframe is required is because I would like to use the, those uh, particular sandboxing uh, rules. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I guess what I'm trying to, so, so we have a fairly big app, completely converting it over to you, and at this point, we're, we're a little ways into it, we have 230 scripts. Okay. 
So dealing with that volume of all these scripts that people have written and trying to test one at a time is going to be difficult. Um, I'm trying to get a handle on figuring out, okay, I find Joe's text editor is questionable, but Fred's text editor I've got so many of them. I'm just trying to figure out. When you say the scripts are being pulled in, 230 different scripts, uh, uh, how are they being pulled in? Are they being loaded in the page, or are they NPM packages? Or? Yeah, they're NPM. Okay, gotcha. Um, so this, these particular rules all talk about um, in the browser itself, um, loading from um, lo loading from domains, and what is allowed for those domains. So this is not protecting you against the vector of you bundling in unknown code into your own scripts, which is what the um, NPM installing a bunch of things and then bundling them together. That's the that's the attack vector there. So this is not protecting you against that. Yeah, yeah, I understand that, but I guess that's like well, I guess I guess they're both in question. Like today, this NPM package is just growing incredibly fast. Do you have any? Yes, yeah, so there are automated <laughs> security scanning tools. Um, does anyone have uh, experience with? I, I have experience with SNCC and yeah, yeah, you SNCC. Get, you get yeah. Have yeah. 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 What was it? What did you say? S N Y K. Pronounced SNCC. Oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, it SNCC. just basically scans your your project. They have a paid program. You know kind of what they're looking for or what they have a list of security vulnerabilities. It's in their own. So I'd recommend running both sneak and audit because they have the I mean does NPM do anything themselves on that or yeah they do. Yeah, if you're using a relatively modern version of NPM, um, and I don't remember what version they added it in, but it runs automatic audits when you run an NPM install. So the last message you'll see after you run an NPM install will be like, X dependency installed, Y vulnerabilities discovered, or something like that. Run NPM audit for more information. And if you run uh, NPM audit, the command, um, it'll give you all of the notifications around those particular vulnerabilities. Um, so I believe they're mostly CVEs, if you're familiar with CVEs. Um, I, think, I think that's their primary <laughs> source of information. But it does highlight vulnerabilities, yeah. Uh, and GitHub now does that as well, if your pro project is hosted on GitHub. Yep. Do you put something like uh, Scott's board blog? All you do is basically script site, day pocket, and you don't have control of that. How do you handle that? Still be able to Great question. Um, yeah, so the question, if you couldn't hear, was um, if you're using an embed like discuss or something like that, um, you have, you're, you're dropping a script tag into your page, and it creates an iframe, and that iframe it controls. So how do you sandbox that iframe? Um, so in this particular case, um, you well, I so in 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 this example, this is the same case, right? I, the, this is a platform <coughs> loading the platform Twitter page. Uh, the platform Twitter widget actually creates an iframe, um, but I have then wrapped it in another iframe. It's iframes all the way down, um, <laughs> and uh, that is one approach. Um, this approach. Uh, I chose this approach in this particular case because uh, I expect that uh, Twitter Twitter has changed and will likely continue to change their embed pretty significantly, um, and so I thought it was impractical for me to think that I could keep up with it. Um, also, I <laughs> I look at these projects like twice a year, so <laughs> I'm probably not going to update it if it breaks. Um, realistically, uh, so I was like, okay, what's the most um, the most stable thing I could think of, and that was wrapping it. Um, the other approach would be to, I mean, the low-hanging fruit would be get a list of domains that are required for the 
for the plugin to function, and then only allow scripts to be loaded from those domains. So that's like that's that's a pretty good start. Um, and then you can go through and look at you know across your site functionality plus discuss functionality. Do they need to do geolocation? Can you just disable geolocation altogether? Maybe um, that might that might be okay. You can also disable disable geolocation except for your domain. Um, so then, if, if the discusses script tried to load geolocate, then it would be denied. Um, I think the most common one is the um, notifications asking to to send notifications. Um, that one's super annoying. Um, a lot of ad embeds will ask for the ability to send notifications to your users, um, and you can disable that for only, you can enable that only for your domain, for example, with a content security policy. So I would take that approach and apply the content security policy to your domain yourself, um, because since that discuss iframe is getting loaded into the context of your domain, it inherits that content security policy. There's probably no published list of what vendor has or discusses. Um, content security policies are pretty old, all things considered now. Um, maybe five years old or something, um, which yeah, is ancient in JavaScript land. Um, I, I would say, I mean, some, some, some services definitely do publish their list. Um, you can also just kind of inspect it and watch to see what it contacts. Um, and there's probably, for example, the Twitter embed, like I blocked its submission to syndication.twitter.com or whatever. Um, that doesn't matter. <laughs> like for me, using the widget, that doesn't matter. So I'm comfortable blocking. So there may be features as well that you're comfortable blocking that are technically used for the widget, but aren't things that you want. Did you have 10,000? Um, yes. As long as you have, if your script has permission to edit the DOM, yes. Um, so that is, uh, you know, assuming that your script has the permission to edit the DOM. So if you're like in an iframe and trying to edit your parents' iframe tags, that's not going to work because you know an iframe can't edit its own tag. Um, but uh, <laughs> which, yeah, if you want to like, oh, Dretz, I'm in a tight sandbox. I want to change that sandbox. Like you can't do that. Um, but you, yeah, you definitely like for example. Uh, oh, I lied. I was going to say I do it in the script, but I don't actually do it in the script. Um, you can't. You can, yeah. You can, as long as you have permission to edit the, the dump. Yeah. Uh, any last questions? So yeah, go ahead. Talk, we've been talking about putting the in the dump. Is that the wrapper that you usually use? You put it in the div, or how does that? Yeah, so, um, so I mentioned earlier about browser sandbox, and this is all about extending the browser sandbox. So really what you need to do is create a new browsing context. So that happens in pages, tabs, and iframes. Um, so if you're going to apply a security rule that applies to that sandbox, it has to be in one of those three settings. Um, so pages and tabs are really the same thing, they're just windows. Um, so uh, a window and an iframe are the only two really w the real ways to do that. So you can apply the security settings on the header that you're sending back from your server. So if you're running, you know, like an Nginx proxy or something like that, you can apply headers there, which then will apply to your site, um, or that Express app, or you know, whatever server-side framework you're using to set headers, you can use that. Um, or I guess if you're hosting on S3, I think you can change headers on S3 as well. Um, uh, you can do that. There, or you can do the iframe. Um, so the, the iframe one, the reason why I'm talking so much about iframes at this talk is because um, I'm really interested in the like particular scripts you're loading into your page. Um, and so, you know, that, you know, iframes, I think, are a good approach there. Uh, but yeah, a lot of these things, like all these content security policies, the referrer settings, um, those all apply to headers as well. Yes, yeah, um, and that, that, is, um, that is because you wouldn't be able, like you, 
You could just skirt around your sandbox if you just created six nested iframes. Ha! I'm free! Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they are hierarchy. They're, they are a hierarchy by far. Yeah, um, I would say definitely 100% do do it locally because it's going to break in dramatic ways if you don't do it locally uh, when you deploy it. Um, and so uh, it really kind of depends on the, the, the particular framework you're using. I'm, I don't have experience with you, so I can't tell you about the userve command. Um, I have done it in React using some plugin, I think. Um, but there is generally a way to customize these headers somehow through that tool. Um, and maybe it's like, sometimes there's like some pre-execution step where you can modify whatever server it's using to send this information. Or sometimes like some frameworks already have built-in support for like looking at a particular file um, and saying like, oh, this <coughs> file will have headers that I'll attach or something like that. So it really kind of depends on the tool. Fantastic. Thank you.